on C-SPAN 2. And now joining us on Book TV is Ambassador Samantha Power. Her new book, The Education of an Idealist, a memoir, comes out in September. We want to do a short preview of that book now. Samantha Power, first of all, how'd you get to the States? Uh, to America. Um, my mother, a uh, rambunctious Irish doctor, athlete, humanist, um, decided to get on a plane and run away with a man she loved who wasn't my father. Uh, and they moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1979. There was no divorce in Ireland, so the terms under which she came here were that I would be raised a good Irish Catholic, I would continue to learn Irish, and that we would go back for all of our holidays so I could be with my dad. Um, and then we stayed, but I would not have known, she would not have known that we were immigrating to this country, but that's what it turned out to be. It wasn't all that simple though, was it? Uh, nothing in life is as simple as you wish it were, but uh, it wasn't simple. No, there was a lot of, uh, it was a big rupture in my life, in her life, in my father's life. But, you know, I was a kid and I moved to Pittsburgh the year the Pittsburgh Pirates won the World Series, the Steelers were winning the Super Bowl. Everything was big and loud and uh, there was an abundance of sugared cereal. You know, what more could I have wanted? And, um, and of course, the road that I've taken since then is just a reflection, I think, of what is unique still to this day about this country, which is just the immigrant story and how you can end up going from being a you know, a little kid with big league chew in her mouth trying to imitate the boys in the neighborhood to fit in as an immigrant to uh, representing our, our nation at the UN. Before we leave Ireland and your father, what was the end of his story? Well, he was a big drinker, which was one of the reasons that she separated from him and then ultimately left him. And after we left, uh, he stayed behind and he drank more and more without my brother and me there as kind of, I suppose, his reason for getting out of bed in the morning, he spiraled downward and he died uh, when I was 14 years old, when I was in Atlanta, very, very suddenly. We had moved from Pittsburgh to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, it was um, a devastating end, and he died very much alone. And uh, I've had a lot of shrinks tell me that that's why I'm interested in human rights and human dignity and that I'm, you know, trying to recover from that still and and there's probably some truth to that but re regardless um, it was a it was a big blow and certainly may, makes me savor the time I have with my family I, I'm definitely a count my blessings kind of person you could take a big rupture like that in a couple ways and for me it was wow am I lucky to still have my mother I'm so lucky to be here and so grateful and um, but but obviously uh, especially when I was in the Rose Garden getting nominated by President Obama, you know, I just, it's still all those years later, I just, I wish my dad were around to see it, you know. How did you get to know President Obama? I mean, President Obama. What's the path from Ireland yeah, to UN ambassador? Rocky, bruising, <laughs> um, and blessed. But um, the, I mean, the first break in my life was coming to this country. The second was I went from a public high school in Atlanta, Georgia, to getting to go to Yale University. And from there, out of Yale, I was extremely moved by the war in Bosnia and the atrocities that were happening there, men being imprisoned in concentration camps 50 years after the Holocaust. You know, I'd read Anne Frank and Night by Elie Wiesel, and I was just very, I thought Never Again meant something. And, and so I went off to Bosnia to become a, a freelance foreign correspondent which, uh, again, in retrospect, if my kids tried to do it, I, I w would forbid it. But my mother somehow uh, put her own fears for my safety aside and enabled it, was a total enabler, bought me my laptop, got me on the plane. And um, from there, I covered that war for nearly three years as a journalist, ultimately writing for The Economist and The Washington Post and amazing publications. But all I saw around me was American planes flying overhead and the killing continuing and people continuing to be targeted because they were Muslims or because they were Croats or whatever. Um, so I kind of left journalism thinking I want to be in a position where I'm reading someone's dispatches from a, an environment like this one. And I went to law school as when you, when you don't know exactly what you want to do with your life as one does. And while I was there, I, I wanted to put in some context the experience I'd had in Bosnia. So for a class, actually, in law school, I began puzzling over this question of why we say never again, and yet, in the case of Bosnia, Rwanda had just happened. You know, why 
we seem not to notice when genocide is underway that we're not keeping our promise to ourselves. And that, initially for a class and then ultimately for a wider audience, became this book, uh, A Problem from Hell, which initially had trouble finding a publisher, but that eventually- That was your first book. That was my first book, and, and it Pulitzer. was a miracle. It ended up winning a Pulitzer, despite uh, having, again, a rocky beginning. Uh, but Re after- Rejected? It was, it, it was dark, it was long, I was an unknown proposition, and yeah, it was rejected by dozens of, of publishing houses. But one took a chance on it, New Republic Books, a little sub-imprint of basic books. And, uh, and then, you know, amazing constituencies evolved around the book. Um, Jewish Americans who wanted to understand never again as it related to contemporary genocide. Armenian Americans who felt heartened that as a non-Armenian, I was documenting the Armenian genocide of 1915. Um, Muslim Americans looking at what had happened to Bosnia and also seeing student groups and Jewish groups and Muslims kind of come together in a really interesting way, which we haven't seen in a while uh, these days. Um, constituencies mobilizing for a different kind of, of foreign policy. Um, so the book came out and it had a much larger life and audience than I think the publisher or I would have ever dreamed. And one of the readers was a first-term senator, Barack Obama. And he read it, and he read it not in its narrow form about genocide as such, but more about foreign policy and, and why in the wake, for example, then of the Iraq war, why are we systematically inclined to exclude consideration of human consequences in the highest levels of decision making? And how could we do differently? And he was just a, the 99th member of the Senate, freshman senator from Illinois. He was on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, but at that time there wasn't a lot of oversight of what the Bush administration was doing in Iraq. So he wasn't in a very empowered role, which is one reason I think he decided to run for president. I think he was frustrated uh, in those early years, but he knew he wanted to get the thinking down and and develop kind of a blueprint for if, we, if Democrats were in charge again or if he were somehow in a different office, which he would very quickly acquire. Um, so I left Harvard where I was teaching and I went down and I worked in his Senate office as he tried to think through what he would do differently if he had the chance. And lo and behold, out of that sense, I think, of uh, the limits of what he could do as a senator, he decided to run for president. I joined the campaign. I tell that story in the book as well, uh, both the story being in the Senate and being on the campaign. I ended up having to leave the campaign because I got into trouble on the campaign, rightly so, for my, my uh, blunders. Um, the, you spoke out against, uh, you said something about Mrs. Clinton. I did say something uh, about, uh, now to me, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Hillary Clinton, Clinton, Senator Clinton at the time, and I had to resign the campaign, um, and then ended up coming back to the campaign. So I had the experience of, of feeling like I was flying close to the sun and then melting down, basically, uh, in the public eye, which was a new experience. Um, got a chance to work pretty closely with Secretary Clinton when she, when we were back in the Obama administration, mercifully, or my Irish guilt would still be uh, <laughs> plaguing me, which it kind of is anyway. Um, but, uh, but and then, and then had eight years in the Obama administration, alongside for four of those years, uh, my husband, who I met on the Obama campaign. Cass Sunstein. Cass Sunstein, who was in charge of regulation for Obama. So we had the experience of driving to work every day and leaving, you know, sharing our frustrations and, and both he had served in government before, but both pretty new to trying to figure out how to make the system work on behalf of the things we believed in. We is were kind of academics is, in, a, in a rough and tumble political world. Is the UN ambassadorship the right place for an idealist? It was a great place for me, I can tell you. I mean, it was a place that you could confront aggression in a very visible and vocal way. You know, other jobs are more behind the scenes. Um, when Russia invaded Ukraine or when Russia began bombarding the town of Aleppo in Syria, you can create moments where even if the Security Council itself is blocked because Russia has a veto, has had a veto from the founding of the UN, you can create some form of accountability by just being a truth teller. And you can negotiate behind the scenes even with those you want to strangle. <laughs> And, and, you know, I worked extremely closely, I tell that story in the book, with the Russian ambassador, who I was having these public confrontations with, but then worked behind the scenes to send peacekeepers to South Sudan or to the Central African Republic, 
or to fight ISIS and to cut off their financial flows, which has been a big part of us rolling back their gains. And so for me, it was uh, exactly the right venue to combine public diplomacy and private relentlessness on behalf of U.S. interests. Um, I also had the chance, but because we're the host country and the most powerful country in the world, um, to make sure that we were treating countries in a, in, in a way that, that signaled that we respected the dignity of the individuals who represented them. So for example, I was the first ambassador who went around and just visited every UN mission, every country that has a mission to the UN, other than North Korea's with whom we don't have diplomatic relations, uh, rather than having them kind of come to us and stand back. And by virtue of doing that, I believe I gained a huge amount of support from those ambassadors just by showing our respect, by, again, seeing their individual worth as well as a, a respect for their countries. So when it came time to delivering tough votes against Russia, for example, on Ukraine or on LGBT rights, which are still um, not enjoyed by the majority of people, of course, who live on the planet, those ambassadors were my allies. They were fighting on behalf of the goals that we had, and that's the essence of soft power. So I, I think that you know, playing soccer with the Latin American ambassadors, having the women ambassadors over for dinner, or taking them out to a Broadway show, and, and seeing and hearing them, their interests, their values, I think that goes a million miles, actually, in, in, in reaping benefits for the United States. Ambassador Power, one of those trips ended in tragedy, motorcade in Africa. Devastating, yeah. What that happened? was the lowest, certainly the lowest point in my professional career. Um, we went to, very moved by all the parents who'd lost children to Boko Haram. Uh, Boko Haram coming into villages and literally just abducting whether girls who are taking their exams or little boys who they turn into seven-year-old fighters, suicide bombers. And we went because we felt the world was neglecting this crisis with everything going on with ISIS and Russia. And we brought $50 million in famine relief. We brought the promise of higher level U.S. engagement intelligence sharing so that we could potentially find some of those children. And just out the gate in the country of Cameroon, uh, our convoy, which was going through a Boko Haram area, um, the roads had all been sealed off. Nobody was permitted, to, none of the local people were permitted to cross the roads because the convoy was moving briskly for security reasons. And a little boy, we don't really know, but maybe seeing one of the helicopters that was flying overhead to try to provide convoy for our vehicles, um, maybe he wasn't looking. We, we, to this day, we don't know. But he was struck by one of the, the vehicles um, in the convoy. Um, it, I didn't even know that the accident had happened until we were at a, a, a later site. And subsequently, we learned that the boy had died. So the, you know, the irony of irony, you go to help the children of this region of Cameroon, of Chad, of Nigeria, Niger, and um, had we not come, that little boy would, would still be playing with his siblings. And, and so it was, it was devastating. And there's nothing we can do in the wake of something like that other than, again, show your sorrow and respect for the family. Uh, you returned. Affected. I went back that day to see the family, to just look them in the eyes and try to somehow express you know the the, the remorse that I felt um, and um, my own son that the, the was had his birthday coming up a couple days later and you just think you know here this this family now is not going to be able to enjoy a celebration like that. I mean it was, it was devastating and I reflect in the book on on also what it means at a larger level you know so many people especially these days and Trump has fed this with his rhetoric there's a kind of idea out there that even when America goes to try to help, this is the kind of thing that happens. And uh, while it did happen, and there's no denying it happened, um, you know, the good that the United States did, even on a trip like that, the number of children like that little boy who were dying of malnutrition or were being apprehended by Boko Haram, just what U.S. diplomats and aid workers and soldiers are doing every day for our interests and for the common good it, you know, it's hard to find words. I, I spent the last couple of years trying to find words to convey that to readers who've lost a lot of hope and, and trust uh, in our government and in our country. But I think uh, that hope and that trust is well-placed uh, in most cases. 
So I, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, but um, to actually turn away from the hardest problems in the world, I think leads us to the same destination, a very, very bad place. What do you think is your biggest frustration of your eight years as UN ambassador? Well, the biggest source of heartbreak is Syria. And, and I suppose it's the place where the contrast between what I had written and argued before and what we were able to achieve for the Syrians is the most evident. I tell the story in the book of the multiple calls I heard from everyone from John McCain to the Wall Street Journal ed uh, editorial board for me to resign over that tension, over the fact that I had, as it were, written the book on America's responsibilities in the face of mass atrocity and then here we were, 500,000 people killed, torture chambers, death chambers, gas attacks. I mean, it was like a how-to manual of brutality written by the Assad regime with Iran and Russia behind it. So that is something that still keeps me up at night. I mean, even with no responsibility now to do anything, just second guessing, you know, if I'd argued this way or that way, if we'd done this or that, could, would it look different? Um, but I think the, the balance of what we were able to achieve, uh, you know, whether on climate, which is now being walked back, of course, by the Trump administration to prevent a war with Iran, which is the Trump administration is also trying to walk back, um, the, the vast number of lives saved across sub-Saharan Africa because of our engagement. Um, you know, it, it, Syria stands out as a real um, source of heartbreak and regret. And there's an awful lot alongside that that I, I hope makes it clear to readers why, even though I took very seriously the calls for my resignation, because I think these are the kinds of calls that I might have made on the outside, I had to take them seriously. I never seriously considered giving up the chance to serve. And, and there were a lot of places in the world where we were able to, to make a big difference. So Ambassador Power, are you still an idealist and have you been educated? I've been educated on how to put my ideals into practice uh, more effectively. I've definitely been educated and of course there are dimensions to how to get things done that I have a whole new uh, window into and that I've put on the page in story form, try to make it funny and humane um, to open it up so nobody has to go through the kind of education I had. But I, I don't see my journey at all as one of idealism kind of leavened by reality or now I see it's also very hard. I mean, if anything, I just feel more empowered by the knowledge that I've acquired in these different walks, whether as a journalist in the Senate on a campaign in the White House as UN ambassador. Um, but there is always something we can do and the state of the world right now, uh, which can feel very bleak, I think is a is a call to idealism. I mean, if, if you're not an idealist now, does that mean one is prepared to accept the world as it is? I'm certainly not. I, I think I think we can do a lot better than we're doing right now. The Education of an Idealist, a memoir by Ambassador Samantha Power, comes out in September. This is just a quick preview. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2. Book TV continues now on C-SPAN 2. In just a minute, Joshua Moravchik takes a critical look at the rise, fall,